Okay, in this class, so much of what we want to talk about can be explained by structure and bonding. But to explain bonding, we really need to make sure that you have a solid understanding of the structure of an atom. You know, protons, electrons, neutrons. And I know that you saw this in Gen Chem 1, which is a prereq for this course, but I'm going to go over a very quick review of it. Once we do that, we're going to be able to answer things, answer questions like, why is the structure of diamond different than graphite, even though they're both carbon, right? We'll be able to answer things like, why are the noble gases gases and not solids? Why are some things soluble in water, like salt, but others won't be soluble, like sand? And why do some things melt at low temperatures and others at high temperatures? These and many other questions we're going to be able to answer and explain observations in the world around us once we understand structure and bonding. So, let's dive into it. Bonding. Before we get into bonding, Imagine over a hundred years ago, way back when we didn't know what the world was made of. The atoms that make up everything, we didn't know what they were made up of. So in this time period, around the turn of the 19th century, you've got this cast of really interesting characters that start to explore. Um, the first one I'm going to mention is this guy named J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson's amazing uh, for a lot of reasons. I mean, for one thing, if we look at who he, um, who he mentored, here's a list of the people... He mentored. Uh, these are some amazing people. Was like he learned from Rayleigh. That was his advisor. Rayleigh was a famous guy who, you know, you've, I'm sure you've learned about. Um, but he he taught people like Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, Max Born, one of these early early quantum physicist people, Niels Bohr, all these people. Anyway, so he's an amazing guy. Uh, but he was trying to figure out what was going on in atoms. And one of his first experiments was he built together this cathode ray tube. So in a cathode ray tube, it's a vacuum tube, so it's a big dome that you pull a vacuum on. You've got your cathode here and your anode here. That just means that one's positively charged and one's negatively charged, right? So they put a charge, a positive charge on the anode over here, a negative charge on the cathode. And what that does is, since it's under a vacuum, if you put a big enough charge difference between these, that's a big voltage difference. That creates an electric field between them. If it's large enough, it'll actually start to strip away electrons, and they will fly towards the anode side. But there's a little hole here, and the electrons can go through that hole, and then they travel through this device, where he's got a bar magnet, right, the north and the south end. So there's a magnetic field traveling this way. So if the, mag if the electrons are flying this way, the magnetic field is perpendicular, it's orthogonal to it. And then, above and below, you have another electric field that you can change the charge on. So... Remember back to physics one, you've probably taken that or maybe you're taking it now, but if you have a charged particle and it's moving in a magnetic field under an electric field, right, your charged particle moves this way, right hand rule, the field is this way, it experiences a force in this direction, right, you end up with this right hand rule, so it experiences a force, and sure enough, these electrons, as they went launching through this magnetic field with this electric field applied to them, depending on which way he applied the electric field, positive, negative, or negative, positive, he could make these electrons deviate from their course. If no electric field was here, they would go straight through. But he could also make them travel upwards or downwards. And so by doing this, he was able to figure out what the charge to mass ratio was for electrons. So there you have it. The first evidence that something negatively charged must exist in the atoms. Now, um, they knew something was negatively charged in there, but they didn't know how it was you know placed in the atom and they knew that if there was negative there must be positive so in the early days he figured that the positively charged with the nucleus they assumed something called the plum pudding model so in plum pudding you've got bits of plum or raisins right and they're sort of scattered about in the oatmeal so he figured the positive charge was sort of swimming around and then you had these discrete little negative charges which he could observe in this device here okay and he wins the nobel prize for this pretty exciting um, now, let's move to Millikan, Robert Millikan, of the, you probably have heard about this, the oil drop experiment, okay? So, um, Millikan's an amazing character. I love Millikan because he, uh, he ends up getting the Nobel Prize for physics, right? But he was not a physicist. He actually studied classics, Greek and Latin, um, and I love it. He has this amazing quote. Let's read it here. He was, um, he was at Columbia University. Uh, and actually this is as an undergrad. He was doing his bachelor's degree at Oberlin College in 1891, and he's a sophomore. He says, at the close of my sophomore year, my Greek professor asked me to teach the course in elementary physics in the preparatory department during the next year. So imagine that that's you. Put yourself on your engineers. Imagine that your engineering teacher like myself asked you, oh, by the way, we need somebody to teach Greek next year. I mean, it's basically the same difference, right? Uh, but it's not actually because he says, to my reply, I said, I didn't know any physics at all. And his answer was, anyone who can do well in my Greek um, can teach physics. 
All right, I said. Uh, you'll have to take the consequences, but I'll try and see what I can do. And at once I purchased Avery's Elements of Physics, some textbook at the time, and I spent the greater part of my summer vacation of 1889 at home trying to master the subject. This is so amazing. I doubt if I have ever taught better in my life than in my first course of physics in 1889. I was so intensely interested in keeping my knowledge ahead of that of the class, they may have caught some of my own interest and enthusiasm. And let me just say that I feel a bit like that. It wasn't that long ago that I was a student in your shoes taking classes. So um, uh, as you guys come to our Discord sessions with questions, uh, realize that if I don't know the answer, I'll just say I don't know. <laughs> but I will find out for you. Um, and I am really excited about the possibility of, of you all learning as well. So anyways, Robert Millikan, what did he do for this? He's the one who figured out the actual charge of the electron. We knew the charge to mass ratio from this experiment from Thomson, but we didn't know the actual charge yet. So what he does, he takes this oil spray. So with this little device, he can create these little particles of these little tiny oil droplets, okay? Now, gravity is pointing downwards, so these little droplets are wanting to settle down and fall. But then, as they fall through this little tiny hole, between this, he has an, a uniform electric field, right? Now, if you have something with charge on it, and it falls down through a hole into an electric field area, depending on how big the electric field is and which direction it is, you could actually repel that charge to make it go upwards. So you could either make it fly right back out, you could have it slam all the way down if you switch the field, or if you tuned it just right, you could have the force of the electric field equal out of gravity, and it would just stay put. It would hover in place. And then he connects a microscope to it, and he sees that it's hovering. He can measure how big the droplet is, and therefore how many electrons there must be, and voila. They've got the charge of an electron. So very, very cool experiment. It's crazy that that actually works, right? It's crazy. Um, that's, the, that's the oil drop experiment. Okay, so next up, we still are living in the plum pudding model where we think positive charge is kind of everywhere in the atom and that these electrons are kind of everywhere and that we can you know, accelerate them, but they want to learn more. So now we come to uh, Geiger, Marsden, and Rutherford. This is 10 years later or so uh, from the initial discovery, which was, yeah, 1896. So this is a little bit later, 15 years later or so. Now, Rutherford's gold foil experiment is another famous one. You've probably heard of it, right? He took uh, some sort of, uh, this was an alpha particle emitter. What's an alpha particle? We're not going to get into it too much in this class. But it's, um, it's a series of different particles that are put together. An alpha particle consists of two protons and two neutrons bound together, right? So it's a little clump of these atomic things. So it's not like it's just a proton. It's two protons, two uh, neutrons. Nevertheless, that's your alpha particle, okay? So he takes this thing, and he starts shooting it at this really thin strip of gold foil, okay? Now, why would they use gold and other things? We'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but he used gold foil. It had to be thin. But what they noticed is that as you shot it through it, some of it went straight through, and you'd see a bright spot on this. Uh, this detecting screen was a phosphorescent paper that would light up when atoms would hit, when these alpha particles would hit it. And so most of it would go straight through, but a significant number got deflected, and that was interesting. And you're shooting it, and it deflects just a little bit. And then to his amazement, I absolutely shocked him, some of them actually bounced almost straight back, right? So I, I love his quote by this. It's on um, right here. Here's what he said. It says, many years later, reflecting on his reaction to those results of these things bouncing straight back, he says the following. It was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you had fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you, right? Uh, these things had very high energy. They should have just blasted right through that gold foil. So for them to not only get deflected was surprising, but for them to bounce back was downright shocking. And the only reasonable explanation was the following, that if you've got something very highly positively charged, then you, you're shooting something positively charged at it, they must repel one another. And so that's why you're getting this slight deflection. And if it actually hits it, which is not very common, it's a pretty rare event, that means that this is very small, positively charged region, and it must be dense, right? Strong enough that when it gets hit, it can actually deflect it almost straight back, okay? So all of a sudden, that throws out the plum pudding model. It doesn't mean that positive charge is sort of scattered everywhere. It means that there's a point where there is a very large positive charge, okay? So he wins the Nobel Prize for this. Actually, uh, not for this, for radioactive element research a little bit later on. So now we have gotten to the point where we know that, okay, there's negative electrons. They exist. We don't know exactly where they are. We know there's a point of positive charge, though, so we're getting better. Our, our molecular understanding is getting better. 
We didn't yet know about electron levels. So the way we learned about those is with Niels Bohr, just a couple years later, who built on the work of Johann Rydberg, actually. Um, and Rydberg built on the work of, what's his name? Uh, Johann Jacob Balmer, like the Balmer series, right? So there's a, none of these people did their work alone. They all were learning from each other. But in any case, what they did is they said there's something called black body radiation. Now, what is black body radiation? You know what it is. You just don't know by that name. If you've ever seen the sun, right? The sun is glowing bright light that's hitting us, and it's lots of different wavelengths. The, the, the energy from the sun is actually a bunch of different energies, right? Sun wavelength spectrum. So the, the light coming from the sun is actually not a single color, right? It, it looks white because that's because it's all colors. So here's the solar spectrum. It's actually all of these different... So here's the intensity versus wavelength. It's a bunch of different things. All the visible rain re regime, but lots of other stuff like UV light. That's the shorter stuff. Well, that's the stuff that damages us. There's infrared light coming off of there. Um, the point is it's lots of different light, okay? So that's what this represents. Black body radiation, it, radiation is all these different wavelengths of light that we can see with our eyes. Then what these early scientists started doing is they started taking films of different elements, a film of pure lithium, a film of pure sodium, a film of you know different elements, and when they would hold it up to the sunlight, right, they noticed that it absorbed certain wavelengths. Little bands got absorbed, right? So lithium absorbed those, right? But then sodium didn't absorb the same thing. Potassium didn't absorb the same thing. They were all unique. So two observations here. One, discrete energy levels were getting absorbed. Two, every element's kind of different. They exhibit similar trends, but they look very different, okay? So Niels Bohr scratched his head about this. Rydberg, these guys are thinking about it for a long time. And they come to this realization. They say, all right, if energy's getting absorbed and then later released and we can observe it, it must be the case that you've got these different energy levels and that electrons, instead of just being kind of wherever, they must occupy specific energy levels. Now, whether these are circular or not, we'll get to in a minute, but let me just draw them as circles for now. And that means that they can change between these energy levels. Maybe something down here can get bumped up to there. Maybe that can drop down to here or down to there, right? So this concept of uh, electrons being able to occupy discrete energy levels that are fixed by rules that they didn't quite yet understand that was the only way to explain these spectral lines that were appearing. Nowadays, we have a better understanding. We know that, in fact, you've probably seen these in Gen Chem, the 1s orbital, the 2s orbital, or the 1s shell, the 2s shell, the 2p shell with its three orbitals in it, 3s, 3p, 3d, 5, right? These things are, the as a function of energy, we start at our lowest energy level down here, and then if you excite it, with, with light or something or heat, it can jump up to a higher energy level and it can jump back down again. And in doing so, it gives off wavelengths, right? It gives off energy um, of a specific wavelength. We'll come back to that in a second, okay? So what do these orbitals look like? You've probably seen it. The S orbitals look like spheres. The P orbitals look like dumbbells, right? In the Z, X, and Y directions. The D orbitals, there's five of them. They look kind of like X's, right? Except for the Z, which looks like that funky thing. There's a nice little GIF here that shows you what they look like. Again, the S orbitals. Here's your three different P orbitals, X, Y, and Z. You've got your D orbitals. There's five of those. And you get to the F orbitals and so forth, okay? So there's those. Um, so this was another Nobel Prize for helping understand the atomic structure and for quantum theory, okay? Now, we're getting to where this stuff actually becomes useful. Now that we understand that there's energy levels that these can occupy and that they're not all the same, this starts to explain things like ionization energies, right? So ionization energy. Ionization means that you take an atom and you strip away an electron. You do that just with this exact same experiment up here. Remember this, uh, this experiment? You've got your element up here. You apply, you apply in a vacuum a big electric field. And eventually, if you apply a big enough electric field, it will strip away electrons. But it doesn't mean that all electrons are equally easy to strip away. Some are a little bit harder than easier than others. And here's the plot that shows it. So if you start out with helium, pure helium, the ionization energy, the amount of energy that you need to strip it away is really large. But lithium is really low. It doesn't take very much energy at all to strip away lithium's energy, right? It's super low. And then as you go across the series up to neon again, right, as you're going from lithium all the way over here, towards neon, look what happens to the energy. It gets harder and harder and harder to strip it away at neon. And then neon's really hard to take it away again. You go one more over to sodium, super easy to strip it away. 
So all of a sudden, this is helping us give shape to the periodic table, which back then they didn't understand, right? They didn't understand. They didn't have it organized the way we do have here, and they didn't understand why these trends existed. But this starts to explain it. As you go across the series, these must be harder and harder to strip away, meaning these electrons want to be held a little bit more tightly by the noble gases and not held very strongly by these first row or second row and, and so forth. Okay, And then you can even see interesting series in the middle, like here in the middle of the F electrons. right? It gets increasingly hard, and then it spikes, and then it drops. right? So we can explain these in a moment. So this was one of the most compelling ways to show that there must be rules that govern how electrons move between these different orbitals. Some are going to be really hard to break, and you know this from Gen Chem. You know that, for example, a filled shell is very stable. So these electrons up here that correspond to your noble gases, that's a filled shell. So for them to strip away an electron, that's going to cost a lot of energy because you're breaking a filled shell, right? That's why these things exist up high. Whereas these ones over here are not a filled shell. It's a filled shell plus one. And so the atom, it's not that it doesn't want that electron. It still costs energy, right? It costs about five electron volts to take it away, but it doesn't want it nearly as much as it wants the next one, right? Once you take away this one, that only costs five electron volts. To take away the next one, now you're taking away a filled shell that's going to cost five, six times as much energy to strip it away. So this was in the early days of starting to understand um, that these electron energy levels exist and that they cost different energies. So Rydberg and Bohr, they came up with then the Rydberg formula, which goes as follows. It's 1 over lambda, which I'll describe what this means in a minute, equals R, the Rydberg constant, multiplied by the quantity of 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. So n1 and n2, these are just integers that describe the energy level that you're starting from and the one that you're going to. And then r is a constant, right? So this was pretty exciting. They All of a sudden, they could figure out the energy. So what is the energy? That's this lambda. That's the wavelength of the light that comes off, right? As you go from these different energy levels, right? As you fall down, for example, from the 3 to the 1, or from the 2 to the 1, or from the 3 to the 2, all of a sudden, the wavelength of light that comes off, they now had a formula for calculating that, which is pretty cool. So that was the Rydberg formula. Now the catch is that this formula, as it's written here, only works for hydrogen. This is not something that works for everything. To make it work for other elements, they had to change this. They had to modify the, the fitting constant in front of it. But it was still proof that there was order in the universe and that there's a way that these things can, uh, you can understand the energy that goes between them. Nowadays, we have, um, remember Balmer, that's the guy that this guy learned from. So you had Rydberg, he learned from Balmer. So they named this series after them. As things drop from some higher energy level and end at the second energy level, we call those the Balmer series. The ones that go from higher and end at the first, that's the Lyman series or the Poshin series. Sometimes we call these the K, L, and M transitions. Um, nevertheless, we start to understand that as things, as electrons change their energy level, they can absorb and give off light. Therefore, radiation has this energy dependence on wavelength. And now we're going to introduce an important formula that we're going to use multiple times over the semester. The energy of this light that's coming off or being absorbed, energy, is equal to h nu. So that's Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. More commonly, we see it re written this way, h c over lambda, where h is Planck's constant, c is now the speed of light, and then lambda is your wavelength of light. Now. You can look these things up, but realize that h times c, an easy uh, thing to remember is that's equal to 1239 electron volt nanometers. Okay, Why is that useful? Because most of the time the energy that we're talking about over here, the energy range is on the order of electron volts. Right? You'll notice that here these are always written in electron volts. Now you could convert it to any other energy you want, joules, calories, whatever you want, right? You could con BTUs, right? British thermal units. But that would not make sense because we're talking about tiny energies and a joule is going to be a is a much larger unit of energy. So you can convert joules to electron volts, right? Or what I suggest you do is just use this one. This conversion right here has it in electron volt nanometers. Now why is nanometer what we want in terms of length? 
Well, if you look at light, right, over here, if you look at like our spectrum, it's almost always given as a function of nanometer, like right here, right? The light is given as, get that out of the way. These are written as nanometer, right? So it's just a convenient way to do it. If you plug in these values like so, what you're going to get is an energy in electron volts if you put in a wavelength in nanometers. So let's try this together. Let's do an example of this. Okay. So let's do this one right here. Let's say you were going from 13.6 down to 3.4. So tell me about the light that comes off. It says right here it's UV. Let's determine that ourselves. Let's see what wavelength of light that's going to be. Well, 13.6 minus 3.4, that's our energy difference. So 13.6 minus 3.4. Notice these are negatives, but I'm talking about the difference, so it doesn't matter. I just need the difference between them, okay? That's going to be equal to 1239 electron volt nanometers divided by this. This is in electron volts, so let's make sure we include that. That way, we're allowed to cross out energy on both sides. Good, so we're doing this correctly. So 13.6 uh, minus 3.4, that's 10.2 equals 1239 nanometers over lambda. So we bring the lambda over, divide that. Let's do that real quick. 1239 divided by 10.2. So 1239 divided by 10.2 is um, 121.4. So lambda is equal to 121.4 nanometers. Is that UV light? Let's test. Come over here. Um, um, X-ray, uh, let's see, light spectrum. Okay, right here. So UV light should exist in the what region? Okay, right here. Yeah, infrared. Let's find one in, in nanometers. That'll make this easier to see. Yeah, right over here. Okay. So if you're in the um, several hundred, we know that the visible goes from 400 to 700. That's the visible light of all the electromagnetic spectrum. We can only see between 400 and 700, which is pretty amazing. But UV light is smaller than that, a couple hundred which is exactly where we're at. We're at 121, so sure enough, that would be UV light. It would not be infrared or microwave or x-rays. It would be UV light that this gave off in that transition. So that is a chemistry fast forward um, of the structure of atoms and that electrons can transition between them. In the next video, we're gonna talk about why do we learn about this and what is it good for? Uh, the first thing we're gonna show is that we can actually use these transitions as elements hop from different states to characterize different materials. So we'll start the next time.